Hello and welcome to Digest This, where we discuss day-to-day -day clinical issues in gastroenterology. My name is Julia Gauci and I'm a gastroenterology trainee in the southeast of Scotland. Today we are going to be discussing surveillance in inflammatory bowel disease. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Shahida Din, a consultant gastroenterologist in Edinburgh and the national lead for IBD surveillance in Scotland. Welcome Dr. Din. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for inviting me today. So I think most of our viewers are very familiar with IBD diagnosis and management. We're all aware that it's a lifelong condition which carries a risk for colorectal cancer. With the pandemic, there have been unprecedented pressures on our endoscopy units, making coronoscopic surveillance a particularly hot topic. So I suppose it might be worth by starting with reminding ourselves why we do surveillance in the first place. Why do IBD patients have an increased risk for developing colorectal cancer? So Julia, that's a really good point to start with, to try and describe why we do surveillance. So we know that surveillance um, is important in people with IBD because they do have an increased risk of cancer. And that cancer risk is associated with inflammatory factors, such as the extent, duration and severity of disease. But it's also associated with other factors, such as primary sclerosis and cholangitis and having a first degree who's had bowel cancer less than the age of 50. But there are also other inherent factors such as age and sex and perhaps lifestyle factors that may affect your cancer risk. The reason why we think patients have an increased risk in inflammatory bowel disease is particularly related to the result of chronic inflammation which is thought to lead to carcinogenesis. And that is very similar to chronic inflammation in other disease states, for example, Barrett's esophagus or H. pylori associated gastritis or viral hepatitis. And all of these conditions are thought to be pro-carcinogenic. The simplest models to think about why that may be is that when you have an injury to the bowel, so you have chronic injury, that leads to tissue damage. And so you have an area where you've got tissue damage, but you also need tissue repair. So in order to have tissue repair, cells need to proliferate. Um, when cells proliferate, they often will have a selective advantage, and that may result in an environment where you get mutations that then sadly lead on to cancer itself. Um, the increased risk has definitely been demonstrated. Um, you know, there are population-based studies that show both for ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, the risk is approximately 2% more than the general population. And that's come from population-based studies rather than studies from um, tertiary referral centres where for some patients who have a higher risk. For example, for ulcerative colitis, the most recent population-based study has come from Olin and colleagues that have showed that in Denmark and Sweden, they've looked at a large registry of patients, or for example, 96,000 patients that have shown that the risk is approximately 2.4% more than the general population. Um, the similar group have also looked at Crohn's disease, and they have shown that the risk for small bowel Crohn's disease is zero or one, um, so no risk at all. But for ulcerative colitis, it is actually 1.4, so there's increased risk there as well. In addition to the just ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, there's also an increased risk in the paediatric population, which isn't as well defined, but it does occur. Um, so that is a rare event in children that can also lead to fatalities. And you also have an increased risk in pouches. So pouches need surveillance. Okay. So you've explained quite clearly that all of our IBD patients are at an increased risk of colorectal cancer compared to the general population. Is there any way we can stratify our patients further so we can streamline the service? Yeah, so you've exactly pointed out the um, problem that we have is that you have lots of patients who will be at increased risk, but the risk within that individual patient will be dependent on their own factors. So the BSG guidelines, which we currently follow, were originally made in 2002, and then we have an update in 2010. And what they've done is tried to risk categorise patients based on these factors, such as the severity of inflammation, whether they have primary sclerosis and cholangitis, and whether anybody in their family has colorectal cancer. And you've ended up with three categories which are actually very useful. So you've got a high risk category that needs surveillance every year. You have an intermediate risk category that needs surveillance every three years. And you have a low risk category in which five year surveillance seems appropriate. Um, the British guidelines that we follow are very similar to the European guidelines and the American or the scenic guidelines are slightly more stringent as to when they do or how they do surveillance. Okay, thank you. So I guess we're saying that over the course of an IBD patient's life, we're committing them to multiple colonoscopies. Mm 
Is there any evidence to support that surveillance actually works? So we have evidence from the recent systematic review from the Cochrane team and what they've shown is with observational studies and they've looked at approximately um, a handful of studies and they've included 7,000 patients that have shown that if you undergo surveillance compared to a population that did not undergo surveillance, it appears that you detect cancer early and that's a reason for the reduced morbidity or mortality associated with surveillance procedures itself. It sounds like the guidelines for risk stratification are quite clearly defined but the same cannot be said for the actual endoscopic modalities we should employ. And I suppose that's in part due to the speed at which these techniques are evolving. Can you tell us a bit more about this and what the current recommendations would be? Yeah, so I mean, you're absolutely right that you know the speed with which endoscopic technology has really evolved has been impressive in the last five to seven years. And we've seen newer modalities that enhance mucosa in very detailed ways that allow us to give you that resolution that you need to look for all these subtle changes. I think before we actually get to the different type of mortalities, it's really important to do the basics well. And that means making sure that your patient has good bowel preparation, so you have a clean bowel to start with, making sure that if it's during a period of active inflammation that you then repeat the procedure at a time when the inflammation is less or not present. You also want to make sure that you give adequate time, so it's time to actually look at the mucosa in a lot of detail. And you want it to be done by a skilled person who is motivated to actually do those procedures because they do take a fair amount of time. So I think if we do the basics well, then we can start to think about which type of modalities might actually enhance our own skills or you know, enhance the ability to see mucosal irregularities, which is what we're trying to achieve. So when we had the BSG guidelines in 2010, um, we were using standard white light endoscopy. And at that time, it was shown that chromo endoscopy, where you're able to inject a dye onto the lining of the bowel, will show up mucosal irregularities, but it'll also help define the margins. So you can try and work out you know, whether it's an area of dysplasia or not. Um, so that's a really important feature we've been using. I think the limits that we have with chromo endoscopy is that it can be limited if the bowel preparation is poor. It can be limited if you have active inflammation. And also not everybody feels confident using chromo endoscopy. Um, so sadly, the uptake has not been as great as we would think. Um, the newer modalities that have now been developed are obviously the very high definition colonoscopes and they provide greater mucosal enhancement and resolution, really allowing you to see detail. And there's some randomised controlled trials that suggest when you have a high definition white light endoscope, you, the additional gain that you get with chromo endoscopy is perhaps marginal and maybe that could then be kept for patients at high risk where you want that marginal gain to try and look for obvious dysplasia or cancer where you want to be able to detect it to improve the long-term outcomes. So if you were thinking about other ways that the technique has evolved, then certainly we, there's new virtual chromo endoscopy which has been developed. So that's high definition colonoscopes that have an additional um, processing such as narrow band imaging, um, eye scan or vice or the newer one is blue white light imaging which can give you additional mucosal enhancement and some of the most recent trials that have been published and these are randomized controlled trials in small sets of patients but they have shown that virtual chromo endoscopy is adequate or non-inferior to high definition chromo endoscopy and for that reason what virtual chromo endoscopy offers you is actually being able to do the same technique in less time and perhaps you don't need the same skill set with actually injecting dye all the time so there are you know, impressive advancements that we are seeing um, and really it will depend on the tools that are available at your unit and your own skill set and your ability and experience to use them adequately at the time. Do you think this spells the end of dye spray? So again, that's a very uh, good hot topic that's been debated as to whether dye spray can be cast aside. I think what the trials do show is that you, know, you might have an additional gain in patients who are very high risk or it might be useful to use chromo endoscopy or dye spray when you're actually trying to characterise a lesion, which is really important to determine whether you can resect it or not. As we become more conscious about green endoscopy, another controversial area is the biopsy protocol. And I suppose if you're saying that our imaging techniques are getting more and more advanced, can we therefore do away with random biopsies and stick with targeted ones only? Yeah, so again, that's another good 
as you say, controversial topic that has been hotly debated at the minute. So uh, we used to use random biopsies previously, and it's important to appreciate that random biopsies that you take only represent a very small fraction of the total clonic epithelium, okay? So it's less than 1% um, when we take random biopsies. And so in order for you to actually gain, you know, a positive dysplasia or cancer, you have to do several thousand random biopsies, and that's been shown before. I think random biopsies might be useful when you've got poor preparation or you've got active inflammation or you've got other high risk features where actually having that additional gain would be really useful. And there's two observational studies that have been published very recently that show with using random biopsies, um, you can have additional detection of dysplasia in people with, for example, primary sclerosis and cholangitis, active severe inflammation, or if they've got a shortened tubular colon, which you see with chronic inflammation. Targeted biopsies are obviously the preferred um, way to do that, and that means that you've actually seen a lesion that you can target and take targeted biopsies. And targeted biopsies actually give you, an, you know, they're much more superior than random biopsies in picking up dysplasia um, or cancer, and that's been proven before in studies as well. So I think definitely everybody should have targeted biopsies, but in some cases random biopsies may still be useful to give you that additional gain that you need. We've now performed our colonoscopy to a high standard and we've detected dysplasia. What happens next? Is there any difference between the management of visible dysplasia versus that picked up on a non-targeted biopsy? I think before we actually broach that question, what I was going to suggest is that if you are undertaking colonoscopy surveillance for IBD, it's really important to have an MDT framework so that when you do detect dysplasia or cancer that you're able to discuss that fully and adequately to give the patient the best possible treatment. Um, it's interesting that you mention invisible dysplasia, and you know that invisible dysplasia is dysplasia which is identified on a random biopsy, where the endoscopist is usually confident that they haven't seen any architectural mucosal changes. I think there's now some thought as to that invisible dysplasia is a reflection of the image modalities that we had at the time, and perhaps now with the enhanced mucosal techniques, such as high definition or chroma endoscopy, invisible dysplasia may become a thing of the past. Um, in answer to your question, what we should do with the visible dysplasia, I think it's really important that any type of dysplasia or, you know, mucosal irregularity that you see, that you have a framework to actually characterise that in more detail. And that would go similar to the pulp classification that we have. For example, we have a modified parse classification for looking at IBD dysplasia specifically. And what that does is, you know, you look to see at the area or the abnormality and you work out whether it's polypoid or non-polypoid. Um, you look to see um, whether what the surface pattern or architecture looks like. So similar to the modified Kudo pit pattern that might be used, you want to work out whether there's clear margins and you want to work out whether there's inflammation or ulceration in that area. The European actually community have produced a different guidelines which was available large last year called the 5S guideline. And the 5S guideline is similar to the parameters which I've just discussed, but just in a little bit more detail. So they look at the shape. So for example, is it polypoid? Is it non-polypoid? What are the borders like or the margins like? Is there any ulceration present? What is the size of the lesion? And you know that approximately an open adult forceps is approximately eight millimetres. So they're asking you to use that to size the lesion. What does the surface of the lesion look like? For example, what does the pattern or the pit pattern look like? Um, what about the site of the lesion? Is it an area with colitis or is it an area of quiescent disease? And what about the surrounding area in itself? What, is there anything additional in, in, you know, in that area? Are there other areas that might look very dysplastic? So do you have you know, additional lesions? And I think that's a very useful classification to use. And the reason these classifications are important is that it allows you to characterise a lesion or you know, an ARF abnormality. And because what you want to achieve is to consider is this endoscopically resectable? So can this be endoscopically removed safely and adequately? Or is this a lesion that actually should be referred to, for example, a complex polyp MDT? Or should this lesion or this patient's lesion be referred to, you know, the surgeons to consider a colectomy? So I think lesion characterization is really important because that will determine what the next steps are. I think in addition to that, you know, there are patient factors that you need to think about. For example, if you had an area of um, for example, a non-polypoid dysplastic area. So, for example, what we used to term conventionally a flat dysplasia, 
in a young male patient who's got primary sclerosis and cholangitis. So their lifetime risk of cancer is actually going to be quite high, especially if they go through a transplantation for their liver. So for example, if I was counselling somebody like that, I would want to know what their feelings and thoughts were, because you could potentially remove this endoscopically. I guess my worry would be that in the future, maybe in the next five or ten years, they'll have another dysplastic lesion. And so you have to make some you know, considerate um, opinion as to whether you might refer him for colectomy or not. Um, and equally, you might have an elderly patient who, for example, a colectomy would never be possible. And so for them, you want to give them the best possible chance of having endoscopic you know, uh, management of their lesion. So I think there are lots of different factors to consider, and the MDT format will allow you to give the patient the best possible treatment at the time. So probably we shouldn't be making these kind of decisions in isolation, and we should be involving as many different specialties and different brains as we can. Yeah, so I think you don't need to involve everybody, but certainly, you know, a pathologist, uh, an IV experienced gastroenterologist, and somebody who's skilled in endoscopic resection, you know, they would be the essential people, and obviously the patient as well. Well, at the start of the pandemic in 2020, we briefly paused all routine colonoscopies. What impact has that had on our IBD patients? Yeah, so you might remember, you know, it's now nearly two years ago, but we did have very stringent guidance um, at the end of March, beginning of April in 2020, you know, telling us that we had to pause any non-emergency endoscopies. And literally that meant stopping everything. And the reason that was put into place is because we were worried about or concerned about whether COVID-19 could be transmitted through these procedures that we undertake. And certainly upper endoscopy um, was eventually classified as an aerosol generating procedure. So what that led to, and I mean, six weeks might sound like a short space of time, but if you think about all the colonoscopies or endoscopy procedures that we've done, it has created such a backlog in surveillance procedures per se, that there is a huge number of patients waiting for their surveillance, which are now overdue for approximately two years. Um, and I think IBD surveillance is the poor relation here because, you know, colorectal cancer or pulp surveillance, you have other modalities that you can use, for example, CT colonography or colon capsule. You know, so you've got other ways of surveying them. You might also be able to use non-invasive stool tests, such as, for example, QFIT to allow you to prioritise within that group itself. Um, and sadly for IBD, you know, the majority of trusts or health boards around the country are really desperately trying to schedule the very high risk procedures for patients. But you also, as you see, have a large cohort of patients that need urgent prioritisation. And I think one part of our prioritisation is to consider whether everybody needs to continue with the surveillance itself. Um, you know, we've got real, a real precedence now to think about whether everybody needs surveillance or whether there's some low-risk groups who actually could be de-escalated and sought surveillance. And you mentioned IBD being this sort of poor relation. And I suppose you're alluding to the fact that other forms of surveillance are utilising non-endoscopic methods of risk stratification, such as QFIT. Do you think there's any role for that in IBD surveillance? I'll just draw you back a little bit. So QFIT actually detects degraded blood. And we know that degraded blood is associated with polyps and cancers. With IBD surveillance, you're looking for flat or dysplastic lesions that may not necessarily bleed, or we don't, or we believe don't bleed. So perhaps QFIT might not be an alternative to colonoscopy surveillance. I think the way in which we can use QFIT and perhaps calprotectin is how to prioritise those patients within that list. So, for example, if you had a patient who had a very high QFIT but actually a low calprotectin, you would want to try and investigate those urgently to try and work out where's the high QFIT come from. Could it be sadly that they've developed, you know, a dysplastic now cancer? Um, you know, and that would be the, the way to think about these other tests that can use. I think for IBD, um, sadly, we don't have an alternative to colonoscopy surveillance. You will have ways to prioritise patients based on the risk factors. And as I say, you could try using some of the non-invasive stool tests. OK. And where do you see the future of IBD surveillance? Is there any role for AI or artificial intelligence? 
Yeah, so I think the future, certainly for IBD surveillance in the UK, would be the first step, I think, would be to actually update our guidelines. Our current guidelines that we're working through are actually from 2010. And as we've just talked about, there's lots of different image modalities that have come into play. There's lots of different protocols about, you know, which type of biopsies to use. So we definitely need, um, you know, an increased, uh, an update for IBD guidelines ourselves. Um, and the re and other reason for that is that, you know, the IBD cancer incidence is actually decreasing. And part of that decrease will be because we are managing inflammation better, but also because we've got these, um, you know, fantastic modalities to allow us to give us um, increased characterisation and detection of dysplasia. Um, so I think that does need an update. I think AI will come into it, definitely. I think where AI will come into it is helping to perhaps produce an algorithm that you can individualise somebody's risk category. That would be one way to use AI. I guess for endoscopy, AI is being increasingly used um, as an addition or an adjunct to your mucosal assessment and detection of abnormal lesions. Um, and most of us may be familiar or have had an opportunity to use GI Genius, which you can use in um, the colorectal cancer surveillance population where it detects, you know, small areas of abnormalities that may be adenomas that you or I may miss. So I think there's definitely a role. Are there any strategies we can employ to prevent colorectal cancer from developing in the first place? Yeah, so I think the strategies that we might be able to employ are three. Um, I have three strategies. The first one is to treat the inflammation. The second one is to treat the inflammation. And the third one is to treat the inflammation. And I think the reason that's important is we know that if you use treat to target approaches um, or top down approaches and reduce inflammation at the onset, um, of the diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease, it does lead to the reduction in risk of flares, hospitalisation and surgery in Crohn's disease. So you would hope that that risk would translate into a reduction of bowel, you know, colorectal cancer risk in the future. And that would be the best way to try and you know, prevent colorectal cancer per se. Fantastic, thank you. And finally, what would your ideal surveillance strategy look like? So I think that's a difficult question. What would be my ideal surveillance strategy? So I think my ideal surveillance strategy would be one that actually involves the patient from the outset. And the way to do that is to, you know, have a conversation with your patient and say that, you know, when you have inflammation, we've got very drugs that treat inflammation. Um, sadly, we don't have very good drugs that treat um, the complications of inflammation, which may include strictures, um, poor bowel function, and, you know, of course, cancer. Um, my ideal strategy would be to actually be able to individualise the strategy programme for each individual patient. And that takes into account, you know, the, the severity, duration or extent of inflammation they may have had. And there might be ways to do that by looking at consecutive um, endoscopic or histological parameters. Um, it might be possible to estimate their risk based, for example, on, you know, doing genetic analysis on their tissue samples. And there's some really nice data coming from a collaboration in St. Mark's um, and Bart's Hospital where they've shown that certain DNA changes, you know, in the cells at the time may predict your future risk of cancer. So I think that's the way we should be, you know, aspiring um, to actually individualise patients' risk. I think there are also other inherent risk factors that we need to consider, such as, you know, when they were diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease at a young age, um, you know, the sex of your patient, the age of your patient, but also other lifestyle factors such as smoking, vitamin D deficiency, and perhaps even obesity, because we all know that these risk factors can lead to an increased general risk of cancer. Um, so that would be my ideal strategy. I think ideal often can be unrealistic. And so the first steps would be to actually use our clinical risk stratification and start to use, you know, non-invasive stool tests um, such as DNA methylation um, to actually risk stratify your patients in the future. Um, and that might even include microbiome analysis because we know that certain um, microbiome compositions can actually um, be pro-carcinogenic in themselves. So I think my ideal strategy would be to have a framework where all of these different variables could be considered um, to give you a personalised strategy for your patient in the future. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunn. That was an excellent summary of a really interesting topic. So the only thing left to do is to thank you and to thank our viewers at home for watching another episode of Digest This. Mm -hmm.